You interact with portals on a day-to-day -day basis, even in the CBD. Then the last P, and to me this was the most interesting one, coming from a member of the clergy, the prophet. He said that was the last P. We have a problem of prophets in Zimbabwe. I didn't want to ask whether, I didn't want to ask why he identified the prophets as a problem. The context now of uh, this uh, policy uh, public dialogue series is that we know that in 2018 Zimbabwe is scheduled to have uh, elections, but while we are going to be having these elections next year, there is a lot of uncertainty among citizens especially the electorate regarding one issues to do with the possibility of a coalition among the countries over 50 uh, political parties secondly there are a lot of perceptions and misconceptions regarding the country's electoral processes including the introduction of the biometric voter registration, the credibility and neutrality or impartiality of the Zimbabwe uh, Electoral Commission ZEC, and the general electoral environment in the country. The objective of this public dialogue series meeting is to clarify these issues, to seek to clarify these issues highlighting some of the pertinent questions that citizens have regarding the forthcoming elections slated for 2018. This topic, we feel that it is self-explanatory and we hope the panelists will do justice to the given topic. As the Christ in Zimbabwe coalition, we have uh, our position which we would want to confirm with regards to 2018 elections, I will go in brief. The first one is that ZEC must conduct, must conduct itself in a professional, non-partisan and autonomous manner in all electoral processes. Two, that there is fair and equal access to public media by all competing political and civilian voices. Thirdly, that ZEC must give unfettered access to local, regional, and international observers without undue restrictions. Four, that ZEC timelessly and transparently conducts the transmission and tally of votes in the elections and announces election results within five days of the polls as stipulated in the amended electoral act. Number five, on the free formation of voter preferences, that it takes place without coercion, manipulation, or intimidation. Six, that people's voting choices must be counted and weighed equally in a transparent manner. Seven, that members of the security sector conduct themselves professionally and apolitically. Eight, that the police and prosecuting authorities allow civil society organizations and citizen groups to carry out their lawful activities without harassment, raids, restrictions, and unwarranted arrests. Number nine, that electoral stakeholders facilitate in words and deeds the creation of a conducive environment for the holding of free and fair elections. Number 10, that all contesting political parties and electoral stakeholders should ensure that all eligible and willing citizens are allowed the opportunity to enjoy full and equal participation in the elections without undue restrictions bottlenecks or discrimination. 
lastly, that the international actors and solidarity partners must desist from promoting a lower standard which is outside the agreement of our regional blocks as expressed through the SADA principles and guidelines governing democratic elections and the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance. Once again, on behalf of the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition family, I welcome you and hope for fruitful deliberations. Thank you. I'll leave this time to our two uh, facilitators. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Marvellous Kumalo, uh, for setting the tone for today's debate. For those who have just joined us, uh, like what Marvellous Kumalo said, the topic for today is of elections in Zimbabwe about BVR, biometric voter registration, um, coalitions and factions in Zimbabwe and what we want to see beyond 2018. Uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. My name is Gladys Changachirere. I work with the Institute for Young Women Development. I will be one of your hosts tonight and I will be uh, co-hosting with my sister Virginia Mwanigwa on my right who is the director for the Humanitarian Information um, Centre. Um, so yes, just to get us going, I am going to ask you to kindly abide by the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition and its members' values and principles. Um, the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition and its members is uh, an organization that upholds democratic uh, values and principles and as such I would like to encourage you that this space is going to be conducted in a manner that allows each and every one of us to express themselves the way they want to and I'm uh, going to invite you all to respect all the views that are going to come uh, of course from our panelists and uh, also the other participants in the room. And as such, I want to encourage that we desist from hate speech uh, and let's stay away from insulting each other during our interventions. I also want to encourage us to be tolerant. Let's respect each other. We may agree to disagree, but let's agree in a disagreeable manner. I also want to um, call upon each and every one of us, including our panelists. As you can see, we have a big panel. So I'm going to invite you all to be brief and very concise and straight to the point in our intervention, in our presentations, and also in the questions that we're going to ask. And then lastly, this is not a secret, it's a public debate that we are having, it's a public debate about Zimbabwe and its future, and as such, let's make sure that the conversations that are going to happen in this room go beyond the space of Crown Plaza. To those of you who are on Facebook, let's free, f uh, feel free to Facebook. Uh, to those who can Sapura, feel free to Sapura whatever is happening here and post it to as many groups as possible. And also to the twimbos in the room, uh, feel free to be tweeting about the event. And on that note, um, our hashtag tonight is hashtag beyond 2018. Hashtag beyond 2018. So let me hand over to my sister Virginia to take us into the next segment. Thank you, Glanis, and I will immediately introduce our panelists, and I will introduce them as their city. Uh, on the next to Glanis is Honorable Temba Mliswa, Independent MP for Notwa. Uh, next to him is Tawanda Chimini, the Director of the Elections Resource Centre. And sitting next to Tawanda is Jacob Mafume, of the People's Democratic Party. Sitting next to him is Zizwai Murisi of the Movement for Democratic Change, T. And next to him is... Uh, okay. It's one engineer, uh, engineer Wilbert Mbaiwa, who's the Treasurer General uh, for the National People's Party. Sorry for that uh, senior moment. Uh, next to him is uh, Edwin Mushoriwa, who is representing Movement for Democratic Change. 
And on the high chairs, we've got Advocate Fadzai Mahere. And next to her, we've got... Next to her, we've got Ruramai Musiwa, who is from the National Constitutional Assembly. Welcome to this uh, important discussion. I think just before we go into the actual uh, handing over to the panelists to speak to us, just to remind you that we, don't, we have uh, a lot of panelists and not a lot of time. So we hope you'll be able to share with us within the three minutes we are hoping to give you. At this point, I'm going to hand over back to Glance. Thank you, Vakoma Viji. So to get us going, um, I will start by posing questions to our panelists and as they are responding, uh, feel free to also pre uh, prepare your own questions which we can ask them after their first round of presentations. And like what Viji says, I'm currently asking you to stick by your two to four minutes. I'll give you a maximum of four minutes to make your brief presentation uh, in response to the questions that I'm going to give you here. I will start with uh, the director of the Election Resource Center, Tawanda Chimini. My first question to you, Tawanda, is electoral reforms have been top of the government agenda since the formation of the government of national unity, the GNU. What are the barriers to the alignment of the electoral laws to the constitution and do you foresee this being a possibility considering the time that we are left with until 2018? In your response, give me five top reforms that will make 2018 elections free, fair and credible. And I want to give you another question. I will rephrase this question just to ask you if you think that the biometric voter registration process is going to be the panacea of all the electoral problems that are faced by Zimbabwe. Um, I was going to start, uh, Virginia, by asking how the criteria you used to pick me as the first speaker. <laughs> because I'm still trying to get around that. But thank you for the questions. Um, uh, the first question relating to to reforms and what are the barriers to to reforms. I think Gladys, if I was uh, probably one of the policy makers that should be determining when reforms must happen, I'll probably be in a position to explain why really. Uh, these reforms are not happening. So I'm not an authority in terms of defining what the real barriers are. What I can only do is speculate around some of the possible barriers that, that exist to the whole question of reforms. Because indeed, like you say, we've been talking about reforms not, not just since the inclusive government, way before the inclusive government. And this, a lot of these reforms are a product of what not uh, civic society organizations said. They are a result of what invited observers to our elections actually said about our elections. So the question of reforms, contrary to public perception that uh, this is uh, something that comes out of sponsored CSOs and so on, it's, it's, it's actually based on recommendations that fellow Africans have been giving to our elections. So the question around what is stopping these reforms can best be answered by the people that are sitting in the policy making uh, positions. But in my view, and through the interaction that we've been having with some of these policy makers, here yeah, I'm talking about the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission itself, I'm talking about the Parliament of Zimbabwe, I'm talking about the political parties that are sitting in Parliament. Uh, you, you tend to get a sense that uh, there's a discomfort that is there with some of the recommended reforms. Key amongst these reforms relate to the whole question of independence of the election commission. The argument being that the expectation is that any body that should be administering elections as defined by the constitution should not be subjected to any form of influence by anybody, especially by interested party in an election process. And uh, 
I think for the past three, four years, this has been on the table, but has been ignored. So the kind of responses we've gotten, which probably uh, can give indications as to what the barriers are, uh, relate to the feedback that one, um, on Twitter, you hear feedback such as, we cannot reform ourselves out of power, which suggests that uh, any form of reform in itself <coughs> would result in one party losing power. Uh, so, so that fear could be a barrier to, to, to some of these reforms. Secondly, we've heard from the Minister of Justice itself to say, you know, they have done all the reforms that uh, they, they needed to do, especially around the legislative framework. And, and when it's, I mean, hearing that from, from the Minister of Justice, with the clear indications that there are still some laws with, in the electoral act that are contrary to the, to the Constitution. Is there any suggestion that uh, the, one of the barriers could be policymakers being in denial? I, I don't know. So, so, so the, there are many uh, things that sort of suggest what these barriers could be. But uh, our, our understanding is that nobody should be afraid of reforms. I think as Republicans, everybody wants a perfect election. I hope, at least. <laughs> everybody wants a perfect, an election that is beyond dispute. And the expectation would be that any suggestion towards improving the credibility of our elections must be something that is embraced and not fought. So the, your next question uh, is around what are the top five reforms. There are a lot of reforms that are crucial. And for us to limit them to five is, is a tall order for me as an individual. And what I can best do is give my personal five reforms, which may not be a reflection of the organization that I represent or you know, the generality of Zimbabweans. I think key amongst uh, the reforms uh, that we would definitely want to see, we want to see, number one, an electoral act that is fully um, fully aligned with the Constitution. There's no point in getting into any form of an election process with an electoral act or any, on the basis of an electoral act that is not fully aligned with the Constitution because that opens the door to contest uh, around the election itself, the constitutionality of any process that happens. So for argument's sake, if we begin voter registration on the basis of the current electoral act and uh, using these unconstitutional provisions, as we've already seen. Chances are high that somebody will wake up in the morning and say, well, the election was not constitutional. So alignment of the electoral act to the constitution is a key a, a reform that, that, that we definitely want to see. The whole question of access to media is another key reform that we would want to see ahead of the elections. Uh, and, and this is about um, how the political actors themselves will access the media. Um, that, that's going to be crucial. Number three, I would probably say the, the whole argument around um, a conducive environment for elections to take place. So an environment that is free from uh, intimidation and violence. This is not an alignment issue. Uh, it, there are some alignment issues pertaining to it, but apart from the alignment issues, there are some reform issues that are also at, uh, assigned to that. So the whole question of ensuring that the code of conduct for political parties, which my colleagues, the politicians here, often sign whenever they go to elections, must actually now contain penalties for violations of, the, of, of that code as one of the fundamental reforms that we want to see. And of course, we would want to see the enforcement of some of these provisions. So, so I, I think from the five that you had said off the cuff, I'll propose these three as, as a starting point. And I'm sure colleagues and everybody else would have um, other additions to this list. Then your other question relates, uh, relates to BVR uh, and it being a panacea to, to our challenges. I think the first question that we must ask ourselves is what has been wrong with our voter registration process and the voter flow? And people will be reminded of the fact that we have a voter's role that has been proven to have contained people that were deceased. We have a voter's role uh, which stakeholders, some of which are up here, have contested in terms of credibility because it has not been accessible. So we don't know which voter's role we are using at which point. Uh, I was talking to someone who mentioned that ahead of the 2018 election, there were actually some cabinet ministers who could not find themselves initially on the voters' room. 
And then when they complained about it, their names were actually found on the water stroll. And then the question was, uh, which water stroll were they found on? So, so clearly we have fundamental issues with the water stroll that we've used in the past. And the question is, does the biometric water stroll then address all the challenges that we've faced at, at the initial point in terms of the voter stroll, but also secondly in terms of the entire uh, uh, election process itself. So on one end, I think the, the biometric voter stroll would fundamentally address some of the challenges we've had with our voter stroll. One, we have an opportunity to start from scratch and get a document that we can potentially agree upon as being a credible what, a document on which elections can be based on. But this is not to say BVR on its own will be adequate. There are some attachment issues that must be addressed. The environment in which BVR happens is crucial. The, the people administering the registration process must be people that are trusted by stakeholders. They must be people that conduct themselves in a credible manner, in a transparent manner. There must be people that are able to be inclusive in the administration of the uh, voter registration process. So, so they, you, we cannot say BVR will be the solution to our entire problems. It only addresses the question of voter registration, of which voter registration is only one of the numerous problems that we face with our election. So I'll leave it there for now, clients. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tawanda, for your response. Um, and I think to start with responding to the criteria used. So, politicians, you will forgive me, but allegations made earlier on are that politicians can be problematic, and they can also be problematic with time. So we deliberately decided to deal with uh, social activists so they could briefly respond and then we'll come to the politicians and give them more time to talk to us and not for them to talk to themselves. So Tawanda, that's the criterion that we used. You're not a politician, so you're not going to have more time. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you very much for your responses to the question, to the two questions. Now I will go on to another social activist, uh, my sister, Fadai Mahere, and I'm going to ask you this question. How best can uh, social media be used in Zimbabwe to mobilize, inform, and keep uh, citizens, particularly young women and men, engaged in the country's politics? Just coming from a background where young people are said to be too noisy on social media and do not their noise does not necessarily translate to key uh, political processes in which they are supposed to be contributing to us. So how can social media be used to uh, effectively ensure participation of young women and men as citizens? Thank you. Um, I'll cut straight to it. A number of things need to be done. I'm going to isolate three. The first thing is that uh, my politician friends in the room need to stop shunning social media as a medium through which to communicate. I believe that you know when you conduct a rally of 5,000 people, the logistics and work that needs to be done in order to get that together is phenomenal. And a lot of the time you don't read, reach certain constituencies because you just don't have the logistical ability to do that. So social media is definitely a tool that can be used in that regard. You'll note that throughout the years, one of the chief contentions that the NDC has been raising is that they don't have access to free media that you know, the, the national broadcast is not giving them airtime, that you know, radio stations don't give them enough airplay. And now they've got this free carte blanche through Facebook, through Twitter, and they, they are just reluctant to use it. It's unbelievable. Imagine how powerful it would be if every single morning Changirai woke up with an issue-based message for the people in bank queues, for the people who are unemployed, for the students who are struggling, for those who are jobless. Just to inspire them. You know, we don't say them back to rally out in the sun, but just put something out. And there is this myth that social media doesn't get round. Now I'll tell you that even if people aren't on social media, they get the message because social media has a multiplier effect. So my mom's not on Facebook, but rest assured, every single day I post something controversial, she's on the phone, she's like, fancy, 
when your name is your president, Nancy, because somebody who's on Facebook has told her and communicates the message. So I think the sooner we get into tune with this real carte blanche that we've got, it will be very useful, especially for us to hear the, from the mouths of the politicians we, who are running. Um, one of the big problems, why women, uh, especially urban women, don't get involved because every time they try and speak or try and claim some sort of space, the backlash that they receive is that, look, well, go to the rural areas. Well, quite frankly, a young professional woman is not going to drop her day job to go to Murambinda to start talking politics. It's just not going to happen that way. And what you also find is that for the women who are urban, it's very rare for the politicians to come and do a rally for us. I say women, but really it also translates to men and anyone who's young. <coughs> urban communities are just not spoken for, especially if you go beyond the you know, constituencies like Mount Pleasant, Harare North, etc. There's just no, nothing, no space that's there for us. But social media is something that's a useful tool where you can gather a lot of them together, where you can get 30,000 views on a video. So I think more um, effort needs to be devoted towards using that. The great thing about social media as well is the instant feedback that you get. And like a newspaper, and like a television broadcast, social media is not static. In other words, if you put out a policy today and say, look, this is what we're thinking of doing, immediately you'll get the feedback, you'll be able to put your finger on the pulse as to what a section of the demographic you intend to target are thinking. So it's a great information gathering uh, tool. So I think, you know, more work needs to be done to just change the attitude, especially amongst the older generation around Facebook. If you look at politicians throughout the world, social media has been game-changing. Um, if you look at uh, President Trump, Pre uh, Jeremy Corbyn, even Theresa May, they're now latching on to this idea that, look, social media is important. And you'll hear a lot of the time that, look, well, a lot of people in the rural areas say don't have access to it. That, again, is a myth. Because cash has become such a problem in Zimbabwe, almost every person throughout the country, and I include the rural areas, has a mobile phone. And most mobile phones have some sort of WhatsApp capability. So even if they don't watch the full Facebook Live video, they will get something on their WhatsApps um, with the information that you wish to disseminate. And what happens in a lot of those communities is that you can have 10 people gathering around one phone to see what's going on. They are certainly hungry for the information that's out there. So I really think it's something that we really could use. Even in terms of information sharing, giving people legal knowledge, empowering them. Social media is like a free tool that anyone can use. Well, it's sort of free. Data costs must definitely fall. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, my sister. So talking about social media, just a quick reminder, the hashtag for tonight is hashtag beyond 2018. Hashtag beyond 2018. Let's, let's get the conversations get, uh, going outside the room. Uh, thank you, Fadzi. You spoke about critical issues, really, um, that uh, we need to, to be cognizant of. Issues around access, issues around feedback, two-way communication, where politicians, policy makers can actually engage with the citizens uh, without necessarily having to convene physically. And you also talked about sometimes thinking outside the box and being where the people are. We know that the people are found at banks, no matter the time, 3 a.m., 2 a.m. Why not, Honorable uh, Tema Mliswa and other politicians, go and have conversations with those people where they are? So thank you very much uh, for those points, uh, Fadai. So at this moment, I'm going to leave to my sister Virginia to now converse with uh, our politician brothers here. Thank you, thank you, Glennis. And uh, as Fadzai was talking, I couldn't help but think for us to just reflect as we continue with this discussion what the feedback has been to President Trump's being tweeting or being online all the time because there's also another aspect to consider. But at this point, I'm going to go on to engineer Wilbert Mbaiwa, who's coming from the National People's Party. And uh, this is the party that is led by Dr. Joyce Mujuru. And the question I have from you is, as a party that is led by somebody who's been part of the ZANU-PF for a long time, what innovations are you coming with?
to ensure that one, peace prevails in the elections, two, that some of the issues that Tawanda and Fadzai have mentioned become a reality for the electorate. So what are the innovations we can be expecting from the National People's Party? Engineer Mayua, who is the Treasurer General of the National People's Party? We, we can allow him, Sister Viji, as a politician, to just give us a brief opening remark and then go into the questions. You are allowed. Uh, thank you, Virginia. That's the name, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, honorable members of parliament here present. You see, I'll start with a remark. I think our biggest problem is uh, as a nation is that I think we lack the ability to self-introspect. That's why. The second thing is we tend to be taken away by the words that we see in the media and we go by them. The first one is factions. People talk about factions every day. And I've been asking myself for a long time, what are factions? We talk about being democratic and wanting to practice democracy. And when someone has a different opinion, or when a certain group of people have different opinions, we call them a faction. Are we ready for democracy? Maybe ZANPF is democratic because they talk about I don't want this one to be president. I don't want this one to take over. I want this one to take over. I totally hate this one. I want us to look at ourselves and say, are we responsible for our problems? Or the current system is responsible for our problems? Or the four P's that she talked about are responsible for our problems. For me, the four P's all merge into one P, people. We are people and we are responsible for our problems. I do not think that we are being serious with ourselves when we continue to hammer on a point that we know we will not get a result. My brother Shingim Nyeza came out and said political parties should stop hammering every day on reforms. I partly agree with him. Because you see, if we are saying it for the sake of letting someone know that when we get into power, we we'll bring in reforms, let's continue to do that. But you know what? We can get reforms today. We can get reforms tomorrow. But if we don't go out there and create the environment for us to win an election, and create the environment for us to take power, no amount of reform will reach the guy of Guy in Guruwe who get to the guy in Mahenia because you will not even know there is a reform because he doesn't even see the need for it. So that's the reflection that I wanted to give. Very brief, I thought, now I can go to the question. You, you say, I want to comment on what uh, my sister here has, has said. You know, I'm an engineer, and I've always questioned what we write in the newspapers and in our textbooks, what we read. People talk about social media. Yes, it is very important. It has always been very important. When we talk about social media, we are talking about electronic social media here. Yeah. But social media has, exist, has existed since time immemorial, and it has always been important it will remain important. In the world that we live in, processes never change. 
what changes in the technology. So what she is saying is what we must all know, do and remember every day. What we only need to do is to master the technology that is being used to advance social media at that particular time. Uh, those of us who grew up in rural areas know that uh, uh, we used to go and look for girlfriends at the wells is where they fetch water. And that's where they talked a lot about what is happening, that's social media. So my sister, I agree with you entirely. <laughs> social media is important today as it was 2000 years ago. Uh, and it will always be important from now on. So as politicians, as individuals, let's get that. It's the same with information technology, which is created in social media. It's important today as it was yesterday. We used to write letters, that's ICT. Today we write an email. We write on WhatsApp, that's ICT. So what I'm trying to say is, as a people, until we know the similarity or the difference, between what we call development and what we call tradition and the past, we may never move forward. That is why we are arguing today on certain things that we should not be talking about. We should be out there mobilizing people to vote for us. Out there mobilizing people using social media. I'm coming to the role of social media and answering the same question of what we should do. We should be out there using all these methods available talking to people about what we need to do for them, what we can offer them. And that's the innovation that we are going to be talking about. I have never been a politician, although I'm a person, and therefore was part of the problem to what led to what we are today. But I voted every year since 1985. I was 19 years at the time. So I'm taking 55 this year. And I voted for Zambia for all that period. And I don't believe there was anything wrong with what I did. Because I believed that our argument for changing a government were not the correct ones at the time. And our argument for removing someone from power were not the correct ones. Because no one ever put up a program that would change the dynamics of our economy. No one ever put up a program that was going to change how we created infrastructure for the sake of our international equity. And we need to look at that at the moment. When I visited Mbari, when I came to the university for the first time, in 1987. It was the most beautiful place I had ever seen. I was coming from Guru there. And when I visited every other place, it was very beautiful. But when you go back with day to day, Bali has not changed that much. It's the same way as it was 37 years ago. But I don't see the beauty anymore because we have not changed. We now want to come with a manifesto that does not talk about removing someone from power because he's old, because his name is Robert Mugabe, <coughs> because his name is Chagrai, he has been leading MDC for some time and we don't want a new leader. No. You want for the first time to come up with tangible programs with the tangible budgets that you can say if I'm going to have one billion dollars for infrastructure this is how I'm going to use it. We don't want to mention figures for the sake of mentioning them. I'll give an example of Zima asset. When I say non-innovative ways and that was my turning point. When someone says we needed to use 29 billion over the next five years and I did some calculations, not just as an engineer, as a banker. I'm a banker, more than an engineer. I don't know whether, which one I'm more. And then I calculated that. And I said, even if we had the 29 billion gathered there, 
It's there, we can just go ahead and pick a billion at a time to use it for what we want to do it. And we must build in a year 105,000 houses. Well, that was given in the Zim asset. And then I calculated the total amount of cement that we produce in Zimbabwe and in Zambia. And I said, even if we have the money, we have to increase our capacity for producing cement in Zimbabwe. Because the cement that we produce today is not enough to build those houses and finish them. <laughs> even if we go to Zambia and import it and ask Zambia to stop any development, our project here, we are not going to be able to absorb that kind of money within five years. Our economy cannot absorb that. If we receive $500 million today in this economy, we will we'll run around like headless chickens. We don't know how to use it. When you are a contractor doing a ride bike bridge road, for example, if you do enough work to claim $5 million in a month, it will be amazing. It's not possible unless you are cheating. So what I'm saying the change that we're going to bring is to bring in programs that you can take to an economist, to a finance expert, to a project lawyer, and they can tell you, yes, it works. Projects are not projects by name. They are projects because the designs have been done, the finance expert have found the money, it's there, there has been financial closure, you can now move on to site. When you say I've got a, a housing project, when you've not bought the land, you don't have a housing plan, you don't have a project, you've got a name of a project. And that's what everyone has been doing. We have been voting Zambia into power on the basis of saying we are going to do a land by the bridge road. But if you ask them, where is the design for that road? Where is the survey for that road? Where is the bill of quantities for that road? How much is it going to cost? They will tell you a cost that came from a feasibility study. And you know what a feasibility study does. It tells you how many houses you are going to destroy along that road before you can build it. it but you have not yet designed it. When you design it, then you know the cost. We will make sure that before you go for a project or anything, you price it up to the last cent. So that you, rem you remove the, the specter of theft. Because once you go to, to, to do a project on the basis of, of an estimate. I hope you are around now. Yes, you allow us to steal from you. Because then increases can come and do such things. And then in terms of what my brother said, look. The just, just hold on. Okay. For now we'll come back to that. Okay. For now it's okay. Thank you, Engineer Mbaiwa. At this point I'm going to go to Jacob Mafume from the People's Democratic Party. And uh, you're going to give us a bit of background into the party you represent. But the question we also want you to tackle is what has already been said about some concerns by certain quarters in our political parties that they would reform themselves out of power. Can you give us your perspective on that? The electoral... Is the electoral is this? is the electoral reforms we're talking about, where we are saying as a party, there's already been an indication that it's not just electoral reforms in terms of the law, but it's also the environment. We want to hear what your perspective, uh, uh, what your perspective as a party is related to that. And then you're also part of uh, the court, the coalition for Democrats, and we would want you to speak a bit about the issue of coalitions. What do you think is the probability that the coalitions will change the dynamics of power transfer in Zimbabwe? Oh. Oh, th thank you very much uh, for inviting us. Uh, we are always happy to be here. And thank you for the presenters before me. And uh, maybe I may not get the chance, I will also thank the presenters after me. Uh, protocols observe. Uh, Madam Chair, ladies, I suppose. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an interesting uh, thing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I am uh, coming from the People's Democratic Party. 
uh, the national spokesperson is led by Tendai BT. We uh, separated from the MDC uh, a while ago uh, over some uh, uh, few differences. But uh, we are where we are. We do believe that it is important in terms of the constitution that we have a multiplicity of voices that are trying to fight for democracy in Zimbabwe, for better livelihood, whether independent, social movement, or individuals, churches, and so forth and so forth. I think it's a country for everyone, not for a few people. And when we say everyone, just in as much as individuals have got names that are different, so groups can be formed that are different. They can work together or work singularly as long as they identify an objective. So as a party, we are dedicated to bringing uh, democracy to Zimbabwe. I, well, uh, I also think that I would want, contrary to the previous speaker, I really would want Mugabe to go because he's Mugabe. And I would really want Mugabe to go because he's old. And I would really want to go, ZANU-PF to go because it is ZANU-PF. So we are very, very clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> we will not take it for uh, You know, being old, uh, much as people try to pretend it's a blessing, it's actually a sickness uh, that uh, humanity has failed to cure over time. So if you are old, or if you are very old, you are very, very sick. <laughs> you cannot be functioning, you are actually decaying <laughs> as you are alive. So we cannot be run by decayed people, <laughs> such as the current uh, cabinet, which needs oxygen max to get over a meeting. That sounds like hate speech. No, no, it's not that just speech. Like hate speech. It's an accurate description. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, I know. Very old people decay. I am also getting old. There are parts of me that decay, I won't mention. So, for processes. Then if people are sick and they're in the cabinet, all of them are very, very old. They are dying there. The country is, is dying as they are dying. So there's no hate speech there. I don't hate pe old people. I like them very much. They must be in old people's homes <laughs> where they are kept by nurses and many other paraphernalia. Now, we have an aging uh, society. So I'll talk about coalitions, because other people were talking about reforms. I mean, basically, reform is a continuous process. Uh, Tawanda Chimini is an expert in the reforms. He told us the technical reforms that need to be there and they will be there. I'll speak like a politician. What we need to do is win and win. Uh, Why I respect uh, my friend here, uh, uh, Honorable Temba Muliswa, uh, is that uh, he has won in spite of uh, some of the conditions that he has had to go through. There might be many reasons why he has won, but the fact remains that he has what? He has won. <laughs> Now, we need to have a winning mentality. Yes. He has won uh, to be an MP. It's fair and good. I, I do believe that being an MP in Zimbabwe is perfectly useless. Uh, no disrespect to my honorables here. The key thing is that we need to get and change the president of this country for us to have meaningful things. So, we will go to the question of coalitions. Now, we as the People's Democratic Party spoke about us having a coalition the moment we broke away, which might have been a, what they call it in English, oxymoron, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the thing is, we need to unite in order to give an onslaught against this ZANU-PF regime. Another five years of ZANU-PF to me is too ghastly to contemplate. So I'm able to get rid of the differences that I have with ZPP, differences that I might have with uh, my MGCT, differences that I might think I have with them, and these are honorable. To be able to be able to get rid of this plug and famine, you know, there's, uh, you know, in the Bible. You know the plaques that the Israelites received. <laughs> you know, if you are living in a Zanupiev-led country, 
It's like you are receiving those plugs in the Bible. <laughs> the water is full of disease. It is diseases of eating feces like typhoid. Like cholera. You know, you know typhoid is a basic, basic disease. It means you are eating your waste. Now in 2017, Zimbabwe has got typhoid. That's madness. The hospitals don't work. Uh, electricity doesn't come, there are poles in town, they can't even name the streets, they build settlements. They can't even give their name to say, no, let's call this Tombogara Street 1, Tombogara Street 2. You don't have the roads, you have to use the memory to drive in some of the high density setups. You remember that there used to be a road, so you keep a straight line. <laughs> because in this area they used to, to be a road. So we need to coalesce and win. Who must coalesce? It is not to the political parties alone. Uh, we need the social movements. We need uh, civic society organization. We need the churches. So in this platform, we should have had a, bis uh, oh, not a, bis a, a bishop a seated here a priest or a reverend or even a prophet as these uh, chaps uh, modern day uh, religious godmen like to call themselves <laughs> we need to have them together so that we are able to at least bring alleviation to the people of Zimbabwe from the suffering I, I don't know, maybe I talked too hard, sorry madam uh, chairperson but Zimbabweans have got this false sense of politeness, even if they are being oppressed. We like to say thank you. We like to be polite to someone who is beating you up. We like to, you know, appear civilized when we live in uncivilized conditions. So, one of the layers of freeing our people and freeing the minds of our audiences is being to tell is being telling it like it is. You can't come up with a good program for economic development when you have 95 year old people leading you. You cannot talk about a good a program for engineering when you have a minister who 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 has never seen an internet. People who award themselves doctors that are false. And then you talk that we will present a program, we will invest in this and invest in that with these idiots. <laughs> you can't. You can't. So, Madam Chair, we as the opposition, we will form a coalition. And as I'm sitting here with my colleague, Comrade uh, Murisi, and I'm sitting with uh, ZPP, uh, MDC, and so forth, a coalition with political parties, with social movements, will be formed. It will be formed and it will run for this election. And now, you cannot outsource your liberation. It is up to you as your audience. We have presented, I'm about to conclude. We as individuals are very brave. If you talk to Father Ima here, I visited here in prison at one point, at the cells, etc. She might uh, sound sophisticated, look very nice and likes it. Uh, makeup and so forth and so forth and looks more beautiful than many here up front but she she, uh, no I kid you not she was seated in a police cell in uh, Central she slept there and she got out through a bail application her mother and father were there and her mother was crying now these are people who have placed themselves to assist and many of this Temba Mliswa had about 500 cases against him. <laughs> now, I mean, what more? Most of you, well, after we finish presenting, will concentrate on saying, what is wrong with you guys? What you guys should be doing? I mean, what more can we do beyond allowing ourselves to be arrested 500 times? Allowing ourselves to be beaten allowing ourselves to be oppressed on your behalf. What more do you expect us to do? You cannot outsource this liberation to us. No matter how many times we sacrifice ourselves to be arrested, to be beaten, if you guys are not cooperating, it will be useless. We will be writing 
autobiographies in the next 10 years explaining about our diaries in jail. We need you to participate, provide solutions, not to keep us to keep telling us what is wrong with you. What more does he have to do than to spend months and months in jail? Simply to say Mugabe must go. I, I Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I to ask you on the issue of coalitions, coalescing. He makes a point about uh, being able to move beyond your differences in the intent of wanting to make a change. And at this point, I'm going to direct the next question to Mr. Edwin Mushorio of the MDC because we know that every now and then, and Engineer Baiwa had referred to media media stereotypes, but we do get reports, authoritative reports from the media about these coalitions, discussions towards coalitions, which somehow tend to fizzle away. Uh, you have signed uh, an MOU with the MDCT to go into a coalition. Uh, can you just give us an indication, a best case scenario, worst case scenario of that coalition MOU that you have signed? What does it mean if it falls away? What does it mean for you as a party? Are you still going to be able to uh, have the kind of flex, the kind of muscles that you thought you would have had from having been one party? Remembering also that MDC, MDCT, and the others initially came from one party. Mr. Mshorewa, uh, can we expect the coalition to last? Uh, thank you, Chair Ladies. Uh, thank you also to... Uh, uh, my fellow presenters, and all of us who are in here. Uh, let me start by saying uh, 2018, the year that he is coming after this year, is going to be it's an important year if we are to move this country forward. And our view as a part is that uh, we need to do everything possible to make sure that uh, come 2018, Zimbabwe gets rid of ZANPF get rid of Robert Mugabe uh, if we are to resuscitate in this economy. Ten months from now, or thereabout, the nomination court may actually be sitting. And uh, to that extent, I want to start to appeal to all of us who are here to simply say, just like uh, uh, my colleague Mafume was saying, we all have a role to play. The first important thing that we need to do is to make sure that in our different spheres, uh, spheres we need to make sure that we encourage people. The moment uh, Richard Makarao and Zek announced that there is going to be the dates for voter registration, we need to make sure that we tell our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, <coughs> our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our friends, everybody has got a role to play. And I think it is very important that we stress that from the beginning. Because if the Zimbabweans go out there and vote, we will definitely remove ZANPF. Today, all of us who are based here in Arari, you only need to get into the city centre there. It's no longer the city centre that we used to know. It has now just become like Mbari extension. We've destroyed everything that Zimbabwe, Arari was known for. And all because of one person, Robert Mugabe, whom we believe no longer have what it takes to go on. When it comes to coalitions, our position as a party, we believe that teamwork and working together will achieve, will achieve a lot. We come from, the, from that history that you spoke about, and it is indeed true that in 2005, there was the spirit of the MDC. And you also recall that after the spirit of 2005, we went to 2008. We tried to sign a coalition, the uh, negotiated uh, deal between the two political parties, political formation, MDC and MDCT. And it fell on the 11th hour. The cost to that failure was that it combined the two MDC and more votes than ZPF. And we could actually have buried ZPF in 2008. Because even if you look at the number of seats ZPF won, 
we actually lost some of the seats to ZANPF where our combined force could actually have made sure that the MDC as the United could have probably amassed a lot of seats that would have made it difficult for Mnangagwa and ZANPF uh, and Robert Mugabe to even cheat or even code to go for the uh, runoff uh, elections. We have learned lessons and uh, this is the reason why, as a part, we believe that we need each and every one of us to work together as we go to 2018. We have signed the memorandum of understanding with MDCT, which is, uh, which in the layman's talk would do, is not necessarily a marriage that we signed, it's actually the dating process. It's a question of saying how can we work together, come up with an agreement in terms of going forward. <coughs> when you talk of coalition, it's not just a question of getting together, it's a question of agreeing on a number of things, agreeing on in terms of the values, principles, and also agreeing in terms of the uh, agenda for economic revival post Mugabe. And to us, we are confident that we will achieve that because we have no option but to work together. Because if we don't work together and if Robert Mugabe is to win again, then I will tell you, uh, history will judge us actually, and this is the reason why we believe so strongly that Zimbabwe, come 2018, we have no option but to work together to make sure that we resuscitate this economy and help our people we have suffered for too long. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention. And now moving on to Mr. Masiwa from the National Constitutional Assembly. Um, your party has been on the losing end in the recent by-elections. And yet you, you have come out openly that you will not get into coalitions with uh, other political parties. What are the reservations from your party to merging with other political parties? Uh, and secondly, as you participated in the by elections, you raised concerns around uh, violence. What do you think other opposition political parties should do to ensure that citizens are able to vote in peace in 2018? Uh, thank you. Basically, uh, as the NCA, we started in 1997 as a, a civic organization. We are the oldest of all organizations in this conference room. We started uh, advocating, for a new, <laughs> advocating for a new constitution. We realized that Zimbabwe was in a crisis, a crisis uh, that was basically uh, based on... We started mobilizing the masses of Zimbabwe to make sure that a constitution could be written by the people to be democratic, a constitution that could be also be owned by the people. So that's our history. Then in 2013, we realized that there was need for us to transform into a political party. So we transformed on the 30th of September 2013. It's from there, uh, we are moving on as a political party. Coming to the questions, we haven't been losing in all these violations that we've been participating in. We've been winning. <laughs> We, we really believe, we truly believe that we've been winning because all those votes that we got are good for a, an infant political party like the MCA that just started in 2013. We are so proud of such numbers because we know we are very optimistic, we are building a political party, we've got a future, we've got knowledge that Zimbabwe needs a political party such as the MCA that is basing its agenda on a constitution that is people-centered and a constitution that respects a Bill of Rights that will not be tempered by any other political party that might ever come into government. So, also, coming to reservations, we have got no reservations with, with having a coalition, but the issue that we have is that we haven't found right people to have a coalition with <laughs> so far. <laughs> We've realized 
realized that all other political parties in Zimbabwe are saying the, 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 the greatest thing that they've achieved was to write a new constitution that they claim to be democratic. But that is our point of contention is the NCA. So we are looking forward to find political parties or any other organization that organizations that are willing, that have got the same mindset with us, that are focusing on a new democratic constitution. Yes, we can form a coalition with such people or such organizations or such political parties. So about violence, we are 100% against the violence. Whether it is coming from the ruling party or any other organization or any other political party, it is not only ZANU-PF that is violent. Opposition parties were also hearing cases of violence. People fighting in their primary elections, people fighting in their meetings, we condemn that as the National Constitutional Assembly. We are so proud, we've got a good history, a track record of peace in every meeting that we do as the National Constitutional Assembly, not even a single case of violence has been recorded. So we are a good example of, of peace so far. And we also believe that we are not going to change. That's our position. It's not going to be altered by any form of violence. Thank you. Thank you. That was the MCA, Ramai Musiwa from the National Constitutional Assembly. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go on to Mulisi Sizwai, who is representing the Movement for Democratic Change, MDCT. <coughs> and you had the MCA. They are the oldest uh, organization among all those sitting here. I think you come in second after them, and we would want you to tell us what is your outlook in terms of the political scenario as we go forward? You've been having near misses. would want to find out what you think your chances are come 2018. And in the event that there is no coalition, what are your chances? That is the first. The second one is you've been carrying out voter mobilization, uh, voter registration mobilization. We want to find out what has been your experience in the rural areas where we understand that you don't have a lot of power. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Virginia. And thank you very much to my other presenters and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I will start, like my other colleagues, by briefly uh, giving you the background of the party that I represent. Uh, our president is Morgan Changrai. He is the founder of um, the founding chairman of the NCA in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is unfortunate that Vanachuasa uh, <laughs> and my colleague, it was established as a civic organization in an attempt to broaden the framework and the scope of uh, the civic uh, fights. But unfortunately, our colleagues uh, decided to turn it into a political party in 2013 and in the process, closing the horizons of the civic movement. Uh, I would have uh, expected them to form a political party and expect uh, NCA to thrive as a civic organization. But anyway, uh, that is not a very big issue. Our background further uh, would tell you that uh, as MDC, we won the 2000 referendum uh, against Robert Mugabe on, around the new constitution. We also managed to, as MDC, to push SADAC to establish the SADAC principles and guidelines for free and fair elections in Zimbabwe, uh, sorry, in the SADAC region. They are not a creation of the SADAC uh, region per se, but they emanated from our call for reform and change uh, in Zimbabwe. In 2002, the FDC won almost 50% of the contested seats in Parliament. By that time, we were still together with Anam Shoriwa uh, and Jacob and Nepchet uh, joined the party by then. Uh, he, he was still uh, a lawyer somewhere else. Um, and then um, in 2008, we won the presidential election, which you all know about. Uh, which uh, resulted in a runoff, a one-man uh, race, and then um, uh, 
the negotiations and then the, uh, uh, the inclusive government. We also have a landmark uh, victory in that we are the first opposition political party to lend the uh, position of Speaker of Parliament in Zimbabwe uh, since independence. And uh, during the inclusive government, you would all remember that uh, uh, through the MDC policies, we managed to establish the dollar for two, and also that each and every civil servant from the uh, minister down to the sweeper was earning $100 per month uh, when uh, President Chagrai pronounced it and it came to fruition, and then gradually the salaries. We also managed to, some of our landmark victories is that of uh, the new constitution, which my friend uh, is this one reservations around, uh, which you, most of you voted for. I obeyed the 1,750 uh, amendments that Jonathan Moe and Zano PF had brought. I obeyed the issue that Zano PF itself did not campaign for a yes vote against the background that uh, President Changai would be stopped from campaigning for a yes vote in high field, which you know all about. Uh, we won that. We also are the fathers uh, and the mothers to the birth of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission itself. We managed to establish it as one of the reforms against Zanu PF's wish. Uh, and then, uh, lastly, among other um, landmark uh, victories, is that of uh, the BVR. Uh, we said we want a new, a, a new voter strong and um, it should be BVR. I will quickly go into the aspirations of the MDC in terms of the five key reforms that um, uh, you asked Tawanda and other colleagues here. It's important that uh, uh, we pronounce ourselves regarding that. The first one is that of the independence of ZEC. Um, the second one is um, that of uh, constitutionalism and the rule of law. Uh, that will go with it, the Ishema ZBC, Ishema Purisa, CIO, and so on and so forth. And then the next one is that of um, the voters' law. And in brackets, you would put the voter registration process itself. Because it does not mean anything just to have a new voters' law when the process itself was not free and fair and comes with the attending principles of comprehensiveness, accuracy, accessibility, uh, and so on. There are about 15 of them. Uh, they have just a little bit of time. And then the fourth one is the harvest of fear. The harvest of fear, um, you all know, teaching one of you will be told to go to the panel, the panel, the rumor, and none of us are going to be a rumor. Or, my name is what you are about, you are to go so Zanu PF would resort to the long sleeve, short sleeve. If we lose, we go back to the war, you will lose the farm, and so on and so forth. So that harvest of fear has to be dealt with. And the fifth and last one is that of international observance uh, in our processes. Going back to the issue of the coalitions, um, we are very, very optimistic that the coalition is going to work out. And we are also very clear about the outfit itself. The coalition, I would use um, the example uh, that the engineer Mbaiwa used when he talked about growing the rural areas. Coalition in Nimbe. In Nimbe, and the Kanawagadai Zawan Nimbe, Wadai Zawan Nimbe Kumunda. There's a big debate that goes around uh, where MDC is portrayed as the elephant in the living room. Politicians will choose and pick where to locate uh, the debates. We are guided by two principles. <coughs> the first one is that the coalition process is bilateral. It's not multilateral, it's bilateral. We invite a talk with all those we feel that we are going to collect with. And all of you who are students of history would agree with me that a big coalition will never work out. If anyone would give me an example of a big coalition where you would have 52 manifestos on the table in the first cabinet to say this is the way we are going to run the government, I am not so sure. And then the second one, uh, after the, the issue of, um, of um, uh, being, it being bilateral, is that the coalition 
uh, is about equity and not equality. It's about equity and not equality. This is where I bring in the issue of the argument, the debate around the elephant in the living room. Some politicians conveniently want to locate the debate in the, call in the, in the living room. But as MDC, we are going to locate the debate in the zoo, right? In the zoo, there are so many animals. There's an elephant, there's a, a mouse, there's a, there are gorillas there. When it comes to lunchtime, a mouse cannot complain that it did not give me the same quantum of food as you did to the jungle. Because it's a, it's a person of equity. Even those who are familiar with human anatomy and physiology will tell you that if you wear 5 kgs and you are supposed to be administered morphine, they will not give you the same dosage as somebody who wears 400 kgs because it won't work. What do I mean? When we do our coalition processes, political parties whom we are going to engage will tell us there are areas of strength that we are very strong in Mashonale and Central. Yes, good, well and fine. We are strong in this constituency, we are strong in, uh, uh, in Aran Central and so on and so forth. And that's where we talk about equity. Equality is there when it comes to the issue of fighting for electoral reforms. Because we are fighting for a common ground where Chikubu, Gloria Flower and everybody else, including Okemat, can contest under a conducive environment. So th those are the issues around the coalition. We are in discussion, and I'm glad you heard it from Shoriwa that uh, the other one slipped last minute, and uh, we don't see it going to happen again next time. Um, we have given the full mandate to President Changrai to engage even beyond the political parties, uh, like Jacob uh, uh, Mafume has alluded to. And so we are going to engage uh, ordinary citizens you heard about his rallies when he went about consulting chiefs in the rural areas uh, on the coalition and so on and so forth. The church, uh, labor, uh, uh, all those um, uh, uh, civic organizations and partners of ours. We have been going to the rural areas uh, to solicit uh, for, for support. We have been engaging the chiefs in traditional leadership. We've got so many networks that we've come up with. The war veterans, uh, the churches, the youth, students, the unemployed, the vendors in the growth, in the, uh, growth points there. But um, we face the challenge of uh, the harvest of fear, and we also face the challenge of uh, the interference of police, even when we want to do our voter education for the purposes of uh, the BVR registration. But we are making very serious inroads. We have got a campaign which is called Mone Muru, which is a uh, 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 voter mobilization, recruitment and registration uh, exercise which is being carried out by, by, by the women uh, swing of our party and the youth uh, under uh, Chichiziwa is also carrying another uh, drive called Berekama uh, uh, around the same uh, aspirations. So we are very confident that we are going to make it to Kwita Je Motor Mundove. We have decided now to go underground and work and talk to people and not to be a political roadshow where they will say, ah, machijafura, ah, machijafura. We are now engaging people, we are doing the door to door, and uh, we are very, very optimistic that uh, 2018 is going to be different because of two things. The first one is that there's going to be reforms. Reforms are coming, the BVR is here, and we are celebrating it. It comes with its own challenges, but we are going to make sure that the negative water education, which is being permitted by Zano PF in the rural areas, is dealt with. Uh, we also, the other ingredient, if you want to see the effectiveness of uh, the BVR, is that Zano PF itself, in particular Mnangagwa, does not want uh, the BVR. Mnangagwa, who is the leading master, who is the commander in chief of the Niku, does not want the BVR because it minimizes the chances of manipulating the whole process. And um, the other thing is that the other ingredient to uh, the power transfer uh, and victory 2018 is the coalition which I've alluded to. It comes with this one ingredients. And uh, if you want to test that, uh, as a matter of principle, as MTC, we have resolved that if you do something and ZANU-PF says, ah, Jijai, that is excellent, you are wrong. 
But if you do something and Zanopiev is made, very mad about it, keep on doing it. Zanopiev is mad about the coalitions, Zanopiev is mad about the, the reforms, and we are going to keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Risi, Zvezai Risi from the MDCT. And uh, at this particular time, we are going to speak to Temba Mliswa, Honorable Temba Mliswa. And uh, the key question for you is you've done it as an independent. Uh, there are various thoughts in terms of what could have made you win in this environment, difficult environment that the other partners have been talking about. We would want to hear your perspective. What do you think you did right that made you win? What were some of the challenges? And are you standing in 2018 as an independent again? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Ladies, uh, who are presiding over this. Um, let me recognize uh, the panelists who are here and uh, the audience uh, at large, all protocols observed. Briefly, I'm, I'm the Commander in Chief of Yard Youth Advocacy for Reform and Democracy. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it has no constitution. <laughs> it, uh, it is run by the objectives. The objectives are the ones that are behind you being part of it. It's, um, it, it's, it's very clear in terms of what it wants to achieve in terms of the participation of young people in 2018. Uh, I, I say it is not constitution because do we really believe in constitutions in Zimbabwe? Do they work? So to me, I, I believe that we must be practical in whatever we do. Great document, does it work? I was kicked out of the PF unconstitutional. You see what happens in the political parties, it's still unconstitutional. And for me, what is the point of repeating the same mistake? I believe in democracy through a consensus. When you sit down and you agree, and your objectives and your ideas must be able to put you together so that you move forward. I would believe in that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. As Victor Hugo says, we have student, uh, Young Student Command, where we have people in institutions standing under yard. Not under the course where you say we are aligned to Zambi PF, no. Not under the NAS where it is said they are aligned to MDC, no. But we yard your yard, we contest as yard, we win as yard, we lose as yard. That's the difference. We are the only institution that has SRC presidents who stand under yard and win elections under yard. Hit, we are in charge of it. Mungu, who is here, was the SRC president for the University of Zimbabwe. He's a national spokesperson for yard. The Catholic University of Zimbabwe is also under us as yard. So I needed you to understand that, that you then subscribe to the objectives of yard. I, I want to be very clear in that we seem, we seem to, to, to plant a negative seed in our people when it comes to elections. By profession, I'm a coach and I never train a team to lose. Neither do I train a team to concede defeat before playing. I've never. There will be no point in, in me having to coach a team. I believe the players I pick are players who will be able to win. If they've lost, they've learned from that loss and we will move on. Urungwe West, I stood as an independent candidate. I never campaigned. I got 4,000 votes. Zani PF had over 5,000. Without campaigning, the day I wanted to campaign, I was arrested, the farm was invaded. I took lessons from that. It was the first time that I had contested against the Zani PF. I came face to face with the violence in Zani PF, the malpractices in Zani PF in terms of vote buying, 
in terms of intimidation. I learned my lesson. By election in Norton came about and I said I am going to take these lessons into that by election. The people had said to me, you don't have to come, uh, Odorebo, in Urungo West, we're going to vote for you. There's no point. But I, I saw that my not going to them was actually a mistake because you had the state apparatus there. The second time I was prepared, I realized there will be the same for buy, which was even bigger than Urungwe West, with stands being offered. The violence was equally going to be there. The intimidation was going to be there. So why would I go into a battle without knowing what the opposition has? To me, it's naive, it's foolish for me to then complain after that and get people injured, get people killed as a commander to then say, I was wrong to get into this war. I'm sorry for those who have died. First of all, I must be pretty clear on my strategy. Strategy is critical. Structures follow strategy. Structures follow strategy. You cannot have a, stru uh, a structure without a strategy. Neither can you have a strategy without structures. It's a continent. I say so because I pay attention to figures. I pay, I'm a stickler for figures. I look at the voters' roll. I go to ZEC, I write to them. I document everything that I do with ZEC. I write to them requesting the voters' roll. I write to them if there's any violence. Once I have the figures, I'm able to determine which are the most powerful words, which are the weakest words. Not on um, MDC lost in Ward 15 which is on your way to Chipelo and so forth. They've been winning all the way. When they came to Ward 15, they lost by over 1,200. The election results were very clear in that ward. Mutangwa had 1,500, MTC had 200. I then decided to penetrate that ward. You've got to be able to understand the electorate, which of the wards has more people. I decided to penetrate the rural, early enough because Zoni PF takes about two months before the primary election. That's the time you go into people. To a point where when people went for the Zoni PF primary elections, they actually thought I was a Zoni PF candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so they cannot post anything, they cannot campaign. Because you are able to take, uh, 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 to take advantage of that window period. Two months is critical in the election. I need three months to win an election in any constituency if I decide to stand in it. If I decide to stand in it. Um, so strategy to me is critical. I looked at all the words. I, I then dealt with the rural words, which were very critical. There are three rural words. There's what 50, which is the second biggest in terms of the votes followed by Ward 12, which is in the urban. It had about 2,800 voters. When the voter registration went on, I then compared the results of 2013 to the voter registration that had gone on. I then realized that Ward 15 had gone up by 1,000 and the urban ones had gone down. What 15 had gone up by a thousand in terms of the new, uh, uh, new registered voters. What 12 had gone up by a thousand five hundred. The rural ones had gone up, the urban ones went down. The urban ones went down because they are controlled by the opposition, so they were never going to, to vote because they'd been told don't vote. If you don't vote, you're literally saying, don't register. It's critical for us to understand the things that we say to people, especially as parties. People take that as an instruction. So why should I register if I've been told not to vote? Zanipia then focuses on registering people. As we speak, all the by-elections that have happened, 
ZANU-PF has been registering, the opposition has not. That's a fact. So come 2018, they have actually have had more registered voters because we said don't vote. When we lose, we then attribute it to rigging. I mean, can you win an election if you don't register to vote? It's a question that we must ask ourselves. All that is determined when you then compare all the words and who has, vote, who has registered and who has not registered. You equally have got to engage strategically. Let me say this. Strategic alliances are key. Do they have to be public? No. If you're dealing with ZANU PF, you're winding down. Okay. If you're dealing with ZANU PF, do you really have to be open? It's up to your strategy as to who you engage. I was endorsed by the war veterans who are critical in terms of mobilization for the party. They endorsed me. I was equally endorsed by PDP. Tendai Iti endorsed me publicly. This is why I then say to people, why should certain parties claim a victory or say they helped me when they never even issued a statement? So to me, it's very important for us to understand that. What I want to conclude by saying is, I have to be very clear to say that we don't work. There is a lot that is said, I'm contesting, I'm in Norton right now, I'm a member of parliament. The truth of the matter is, I don't see any party behind me working to win not to win. And uh, I can challenge anybody in terms of that. But then I hear people saying that 2018 we're winning. I don't see Zambia, I don't see NDC, I don't see people first, all the other parties. I would actually like to even meet their candidates and invite them to my rallies, because my rallies, I can give you a chance to meet the people, because I'm independent, I'm not aligned. So this is an extension, an invitation I am making to all the political parties that you are free to allow your candidates to come to my meetings, to my development meetings, and also talk about what they intend to do in the next election. In terms of the coalition which has been spoken about, my views are different. I personally have realized that the equity that uh, Honorable Zuzai talks about is it before or after an election? <laughs> this is what is critical. Everybody wants to know what's in it for them. I also had the fact that they're dating. Does dating guarantee marriage? These are some of the issues which I think we don't have much time. In terms of the voter registration which is critical is what have we done to ensure that voter reg registration is continuous, which is critical. I'll talk about, lastly, the seven, uh, seven point plan that I have come up with, which Yad is also identified with. The first is mobilization. Second is education. And the education also talks about the BVI that is coming. Instead of you attacking it, educate people on how it's going to work. <coughs> the third one is the registration. The fourth one is the inspection. The fifth one is protecting the voter. The youth, you see that Zanu PF uses the village heads. So what are we doing? as the opposition to counter that. The youth must be vibrant, the youth must be able to lead their parents to go and vote and not allow anybody else because they're the vanguard of their families. The sixth one is vote and participate. Vote, participate. What we are saying is that the youth must not only vote but they must participate. Because the youth are always saying, go and vote, but don't participate. In this election, the youth must participate because of the demographics which are there. Over 60% are youth. I don't believe in the notion that you must go against demographics 
in terms of giving what is due to Caesar. Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. If the youth are 65%, let us see 65% of them in power. It is their time to dictate the pace. The last one is protect your vote. There is no one who supports their team unless you believe it has lost who leaves the stadium before the final result. You wait until the final whistle. The final whistle is going back to the polling station where you must hear the result. And if you're not happy with the result, that's when you start to challenge the results when you're all there. That is something that I thought I'd share to you. And finally, I'm surprised that are we sincere about the coalition? I'm not perfect. I make my mistakes. But I think I have two or three people who can assist in the coalition. I've never been invited to it. I've seen political parties without seats in parliament being invited. And me with one seat, I'm not invited. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let, let me at this point just bring it to the attention of the House that we had also invited the representative from ZANOPF and also um, we had also invited a war veteran. Uh, unfortunately, they gave us uh, last minute apologies. So, just so we know. So, thank you very much to all the panelists for your interventions, informative. Uh, some I will not comment what they were. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm protected on this, so I will not say out um, what I think some of the comments were. But let me say uh, we can now move on to segment number two of our debate, where we are now going to open up the floor to uh, question or comment on the interventions from our panelists here. So can I just see by show of hands how many of us have got questions? Uh, crisis Secretariat, can you please assist us with the roving mic? One, two, three, four. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Can I just take uh, the, eight, the eight hands that I've counted? And may you please keep your questions and comments brief. So you can start from this. Okay, uh, thank you so much for according to such an opportunity. I think uh, there's an issue that has been uh, talked about, the issue of the coalition. Uh, it has been raised so much uh, by so many political parties. But then my question is, if you look at it from since 2000, uh, where MTC was formed, and quite a number of civic organizations, they've been campaigning for a, for a, for a winning formula. But now looking at uh, 2000, 2008, uh, even if you look at 2018, uh, and now looking at the uh, judging with the, the recent rally that was held by the MDCT in Query, those were just huge numbers. It has never changed. But the issue now, I think it's very critical at this point in time. The issue is not about the coalition, because they have been recording winning. Uh, the winning, but now I think the, the most focal point is the issue of strategy. That is very, very important. I thought maybe the panelists were going to raise this issue uh, because if you look at uh, all the elections, you will find that uh, the opposition lacks the strategic winning formula. That is where the question is. Because you cannot be playing Ricky every time. I think there's a need for strategic um, a strategic winning formula. That is very important. Looking at judging about the rally that was recently held in well, these are just huge numbers. The issue is about what type of strategy are you going to implement to record a winning formula. Can you see the other people who yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm equally elated to have been given this opportunity my question actually follows on the, on the issue of the BVR. The BVR to me, as it has been said, is not a panacea, yes. But the BVR is about who is going to put people first, Rakawanda and it pa, 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 BVR. Now, given the fact, now the question, uh, probably I'm giving this question to, to, to Orebo, Orebo 
uh, uh, reduce desire. Uh, given the fact that we looked in Zimbabwe, most of the constituencies are in rural areas. 143 are in the rural areas, and 67 are in the urban areas. And demographically, just like what Donald Potemba also had said, demographics are key. We know that 70% of the Zimbabwe population, even though a lot of people try to delegitimize and discredit this, are in the rural areas. What are you going to do? What strategy are you going to, 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 to craft to try and dismantle the hegemon and dominance of Zanu PF in rural areas? Because that's where the greatest I'm doing has been. He has been talking about the greatest strategy, but the strategy is about penetrating the rural areas. How are you going therefore to be in a position to dismantle the patronage structures that Zanu PF has put in place uh, 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 to, to continue what we want to the rural areas? Then the next question is to my, to my sister, uh, 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 the advocate Farai, I mean Fatai, my head. Uh, there, there's been a question that has been posed to you about uh, how significant is social media in probably being a game changer. Uh, I, I have with me here this Afrobarometer results, which came out recently and it actually touched the storm in Zimbabwe. And it, it, it clearly shows that um, 72% 70, 70, of the Zimbabwean population, not only urban, because there is a tendency, a propensity to dichotomize, I mean, urban and rural. And people would want to zero in on, 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 on the urban, ignoring the rural, especially Isusma, Elis, Nema, 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 uh, it actually says that uh, only 72% never takes their news from Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, my, 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 my brother has tried to, you know, try to unpack it. But uh, I think you are referring to, social, to Twitter and social media and stuff like that. Uh, can you start to shade that claim uh, to say it's actually a game changer? Because the majority of these people actually they get their news from, from, from radio and television, 50% actually. But she drives almost on a daily basis. And this is where we, we, we yeah, just to finish on that. The question is now clear. Yeah, sure. Just, just to finish on that, probably to the panelists. Uh, how are you going to get in relation without the reforms, given the fact that ZANU still continues and building on, on the issue of media reforms? ZANU is still controlling uh, the radio and television. Well, the greater majority of the people get their news. We are getting in an election and we have got an acknowledgement, an admission, a public admission from one general sector to say only 5% of the reforms have been done. And we are pushing on to get into that kind of election. Uh, are, are we being serious? I think it actually reviews you know, some frivolity on the part of this politician. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Chimini. First of all, uh, today there are revelations that the Lifestone Group that got the tender, that won the tender to, to provide the BVR kits is not the same company that will provide the central system where the records are going to be kept. What are you going to do? What you know? What are you going to do as uh, as an organisation? How are we going to ensure that the election is not going to be stolen when um, when it's all right? One person actually um, uh, compared it to having to buy a car without an engine. So what are you going to do to guard to guard against rigging if uh, if that happens? <laughs> Secondly, my question to Mr. Zizwai, Honourable Zizwai. 2008, we all know when Mr. Chankirai won the elections, he ran to Botswana. What are you going to do as a party to protect your vote if you win this election? How can the electorate trust you that if you win, you won't run to Botswana again? <laughs> because Benekamana is not the solution. But if you win, what are you going to do? Then I do also to appreciate Honorable list what the, the, the desire and his love for numbers. And almost like one person who appreciates his input and his hard work. But let's look at the, 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 the stage, the, the, the recent centers that ZEC has provided. Let me give an example for Harare. Harare has been given 700 registration centers. Mm -hmm. Harare alone, if a recent center has 1,000 people, already with 700,000 people that are going to be registered in Harare maximum, while Mashona in the East, much, much worse, there's one, over 1,300 recent centers. True. So already, the election, the polling stations alone, mm -hmm. the opposition strongholds have lost the election. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if Mashona and the West has 1,300 centers and fully, Zanupia fully registers its people, then while your strongholds is MDC, Harare, is 700 centers. Mm -hmm. 
And blow is 300. And blow is 300. Maximum number of voters that you're going to have is what is 700,000. Mm. Well, then you have maximum number of voters is 1.3 1, 1. million. Mm. So already on, on centers, you've already lost. Then my last question is, sorry. how are you going to transport sorry. information sorry. from sorry. one center? Sorry, from yeah, one I'll center. Take four questions from one person. Sorry. Sorry. So for the rest of you, please can you assist us? We just actually have no other option. You have to choose the question you want to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Uh, we all know how Zanopi has managed to stay in power. Intimidation, violence, Zanodiro, we all know that. But I also think we also have to give Zanopi credit where it's due. Because it's always been two steps ahead of the opposition. And you find with the ZANU-PF, they've had friends, Yugoslavia, Algeria, Libya, China, Russia, and they've managed to send people there to be trained in intelligence. Uh, so even before the country got independence, they sent the people over. So the, the opposition is not investing in intelligence. At school, we were wondering, but where is your... Where is the donor money going? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not, I'm not. I'm not asking. Sorry, maybe I'm misquoting. I'm not saying in the in the respect of which you a CEO, CIO in that respect. And also the other issue I'm raising is when I want to vote for Mr. Kuti. Zanupi is already making inroads right now. What do you want to say? say? But we don't see the same measure of preparedness for opposition. We only want to put our run, run around when uh, elections are watershed. So what's on the coalition now? Uh, we all, I think we're, it's, we're, we're 12 months before the election, so we're not seeing that uh, eagerness from the opposition to, to get that assurance that you're actually working hard because the elections are already closed. Away. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Afadza, you are advocating for Mununichi Tupachake when we go for voting in 2018. And I understand you are going to file a lawsuit for that. Uh, what advantages are there for voting with an ID uh, rather than uh, using the new BVR system? And if we do that, if we go to vote with our NIT, are there any safeguards to make sure that uh, the ruling party and PF does not steal from the people? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm right. I just have one quick, very quick question. Um, what is the mobilizing ideology that probably to the PGP and the MTC? That your coalition intends to use. In short, I'm asking what is the message. I'm not asking about the strategies, both of us are not expecting you to tell me if you have any strategies here. But what is the ideology? Why is it that you want the people of Zimbabwe, we, the ordinary citizens, to vote you for? Outside to move the very fine, it's, I understand the job, it's good to, to move the 90 year old and, and to move Zambia, but what is it beyond? What is it in, 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 it's for me beyond the move the Mukabe? Because tomorrow, what do I expect? And what can I hold you accountable for? If I if we do that, thank you. Um, uh, as uh, Comrade Muliso, I say, it is clear that the key to winning the next election is to win the youth vote. But uh, it seems the youth do not vote for uh, several reasons. But I think chief amongst this, which they are out of touch with the um, kind of MPs that they have. And with all due respect, uh, the likes of Comrade um, Zizwai has been an MP for a very long time. <laughs> so my question as an MPC supporter, is how prepared are you to give up those services like a Harry Sandler, which anyone in here can win on an MDC ticket and go and organize in the rural areas where we have lost consistency for a very long time? And then, for instance, we come from Mashiwasa, and Mashiwasa, the water was there, and we start with ministerial banking, was contesting against someone who does not want a car. How prepared are you to leave those services you have dealt for 15, 20 years and go out there to be the rural vote, which is giving all the best? Kunodamaru, yes. Uh, my question is directed to the entire country. I am a Zimbabwean first and foremost, but I am not part of it. I've been eligible to vote for, I've been, I've been an eligible voter for the past 14 years, 
it is a term engineers, but not once have I ever gone to register. Because my take on all politicians is that I cannot trust them. They are sheep in wolves' clothing. Come 2018, what do you promise us after ZANU PF has fallen? That's my question. Thank you very much. Um, can, can we hold it there? And get. Okay, all right, that's fine. You can go. Okay, thank you. Um, my question goes to most of the, particularly the political parties, uh, which are um, working towards a coalition. Um, as a member of the generation of the youth, we have been blamed for voter apathy, particularly concerning, uh, considering that we were 65% or more of the population. How can the youth trust political parties whose major constituency is just a subsidiary wing of that political parties? Before we talk about you in government, are you prepared to trust young people with major strategic positions in your political parties? That's my question probably to PDP, People Affairs, MTC, and MCA, the oldest political party. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. We will now uh, give this opportunity to our panelists to respond to the questions. Uh, and I once again kindly ask you to be brief. So, I hope I got the questions right. The first set of questions was speaking about strategy. Uh, somebody was asking about the coalition and saying the coalition is not the big thing that you should be having a conversation around, especially opposition political parties, but strategy. And somebody then said, what is your strategy? And especially the one to penetrate rural areas. And I take it uh, that was directed to Honorable Maurice. Sorry, can I have the other mic back? Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, would it please you if I respond to the questions that were directed to me or because I was not in all of them? Okay, that's fine. I've taken them in order, but it's okay for you to pick all the questions that have been addressed to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the first question was that uh, what is MDC's strategy for, for winning? Uh, it's a very good question, and uh, I really appreciate your concerns. But unfortunately, uh, I've been in the inclusive government myself. I can identify in this room more than 15 CIOs who are seated here. And uh, for you to expect us as a party to give the CIO an PF our strategy in the public forum, <laughs> I don't think it's the best of things to do. Uh, you can engage us, we are at the Harvest House. I can give you my phone number, we can discuss with you in private space around that and also see how you can input into that uh, very strategy. Then there is the issue of the BVR and Zano PF being strong in the rural areas. Uh, this is um, a very big debate, that of Zano PFB strong in the, in the rural areas. We feel that the opposite is true, but Zano PF thrives on the harvest of fear, which is our reform number four in terms of uh, our aspirations. There is no political party which would brutalize, murder, and kill its supporters when the people love it. If you look at the amount of violence that was perpetrated in Zimbabwe, throughout from 2000 to date, most of it is in the rural areas. You will not beat your own supporters. You will beat your opponents. So we've got a lot of supporters out there. The issue that we are doing now is to deal with the issue of harvest of fear and also to deal with the issue of um, attacking where we are strong and defending where we are weak. We are going to make sure that we have polling agents in each and every corner of the polling station which did not used to obtain before. When we talk about the figures that Teba is talking about in the farms there, you would, you would deploy a, a polling agent who is not properly trained, you would go there, you would be told that MDC has lost to Gabe is uh, 400 votes, Shangra is 20, you would leave the polling station. And Zanopia would just send a figure of 1,800, which is not true. So we are going to make sure that we are vigilant, we train our polling agents, 
we deal with the harvest of fear and uh, we defend where we are weak. If we are to lose where we are weak and we lose in a free and fair manner, well and good. Then there is the issue which was raised. Um, uh, you, you, you also raised the Afrobarometer report regarding the popularity of Mugabe. I also went through that. You would see that 78% of the respondents are afraid of Mugabe to criticize him. And from the 78%, there's a question which is raised around uh, the problems that the people are, are facing. They will talk about unemployment, the welfare issues, and so on and so forth. And after that question, they are talked, they are asked whether Mugabe did very well in the past uh, uh, 12 months. 56% of them would say yes, he did very, very well. And then from the 58%, they are asked the question around the votability of Mugabe. Are you going to vote for Mugabe if elections are going to be conducted tomorrow? The approval rate falls from 56% to 38%, which speaks to the issue of the candidature of Mugabe. And then they also ask by political party the question around uh, coalition to say, is it a good idea that opposition political parties should form a coalition to win in 2018? 60% of MDC supporters said yes, it's a very good idea. And 23% of Zanobiev supporters said it's a very good idea that the opposition should form a coalition and win in 2018. Which means one in every four respondents, Zemu Zanobiev, are for the coalition and it speaks to the issue of the candidature of Mugabe. And then lastly, when um, the question here is administrator, is administered, uh, we are from Afro Barometer, we don't work for government, we don't work for political parties, we don't work for, we are not a, a private company, and so on and so forth. And they do that three times during the administration of the question here. And then the last question, they'll say, your last question, what do you think center? 42% of the rural respondents, it's not 12% would say it's Afro Barometer, and 42% would say you were sent by government. So, uh, it's a very trick one, um, it's a big debate that we can take uh, into the morning. 2008, uh, Shanghai fled to Botswana. It was a strategic retreat. <laughs> it was a strategic re retreat and uh, a lot of things were being planned which we cannot share in the public forum. But um, we hear you when you are talking about defending the vote. We are going to establish peace. Um, uh, ambassadors who are going to defend the vote once um, uh, the voting has been done and uh, we are going to make sure that the results, we are going to announce the results ourselves this time around from wherever we are going to do that and we want to assure you that uh, we are going to remain vigilant together with yourselves because if you leave it all up to Morgan Chagra as an individual what we expect him to do we need the critical mass, we need all of you because the outcome of 2018 is the author of, uh, I don't know whether there will be bond notes or there will be whatever, it will be the author of misery, it will be the author of uh, divorces in the homes, it will be the author of unemployment and so on and so forth. So it affects you and me and we all should stand up to the task and make sure that together we defend the vote. I hope you winding down. Um, I will, if, if, I, if I please assume that I skip some of the questions, <laughs> It's okay, but uh, I still had um, uh, just two more that I, I wanted to... Maybe very briefly. Very briefly. The issue of uh, the coalition ideology is something that we are still in discussion, and uh, we have left that to uh, the president. But obviously it will be something along our own party ideology, and uh, the party police, we are in the process of making it. It's going to be announced very soon, but it's a big idea, a big, big, big idea. You should just uh, keep on watching the space. And I just want to uh, touch a bit as I wind up the issue of voting with uh, IDs. It's a very, very dangerous proposition because you, you cannot, they say if you don't know it, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you can't control it. You'll be told that two million people voted in, uh, in Uzumbabaramba Fungwe. And how do you contest that? You, don't, you cannot audit it because you don't have a best line. I'm going to run it in Sadrangan. So votes will just come where you will not have a polling agent. They will uh, bring in 400,000 votes. And you can't contest that. I thank you very much.
In the second question, the other question was to Chimini from ERC on the BVR, and I would invite you to respond to that. Yeah, um, I suppose part of the question was um, related to the information that has come out around the concerns that um, the winner of the tender has with respect to the specifications. And, and our response to that is that uh, the concerns are, are, are similar to the concerns that we've officially raised with the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Uh, we must not get uh, drunk on the issue of BVR without scrutinizing the process in its entirety. So when you look at the specifications that were drafted originally by uh, UNDB, they focused on the kits that would be used to capture data in the field. And they did not look at uh, the supporting elements that uh, entrench the, the credibility of a registration process based on BVR. So the question of the day, which we started raising when BVR was spoken about, was access to where all this data in these individual kits would be deposited. Who controls that? Who has access to that? And the importance of that back-end issue is that that is where the deduplication process must happen. And by deduplication, this is the process of um, using the data that has been collected to ensure that that data is only entered once. Because there's a real possibility that one will register here and go and register elsewhere. So one of the strengths of BVR is that it must have this element of ensuring that a person only registers once. So without answering those questions in the specification, the expectation would be that the election commission actually explains those things. And we're happy that uh, the company that won the, um, the tender has been smart enough to raise these issues. Because if they were not going to raise these issues and simply supply the kids, they would fall into the trap of being accused of having been part of a process, of tempering with the process. So it's not enough to simply say, let's capture data biometrically without looking at how we're going to secure data biometrically, without ensuring that uh, we will have uh, the deduplication process aligned with the kids themselves. So to have one supplier deal with the kids and then not explain where the data is going to be deposited is dangerous. And now, if the political party is here, to be very careful around uh, this specific issues around BVR. Like I say, it's not just about the kids. It's about management of data. It's about transmission of data. Remember, there's no live transmission from the kids to the servers. This is going to be manually done by people. These people, as you would all know, are recruited by Zek. Mm -hmm. And you know how these people are recruited. Yes. So if you get drunk on BVR and you don't consider these other supporting elements, you are being shepherded, uh, as Jacob would say, to the slaughterhouse. And tomorrow people will say, but you said you wanted BVR. <laughs> he is BVR. So, so we need to be extremely careful about understanding what needs to happen. Where things are not clear, the process must stop until the things have been clarified. So, so that would be my response. What we are doing at the Election Resource Center, I think part of what we have invested in doing is punching holes in whatever process is being proposed. And it's not enough. As my colleagues have said, every Zimbabwean has a responsibility. And we want to see that responsibility uh, being taken seriously by Zimbabweans. So it's, it's, it's good that we're engaging in conversations around this. But it may not be enough. What practical action are we taking to hold Zek accountable? And what are the political parties that are the major uh, stockholders in an election process doing about it. So I just want to quickly, with the, with the indulgence of the chair, come back to clarify the whole question of reform. When we talk about reform, we are not talking about reform in terms of it actually predetermining who wins the election. Our interest is not who wins the election. Our interest is that whoever wins the election must do so freely, fairly, and through a credible process. So, so to the political parties here, we cannot afford, I think it's, it's political suicide to say, no, let's go for an election without 
reforms. Mm -hmm. The reason why we do not have reforms around elections is because there's someone interested in having a predetermined election. They want to be sure before the votes have been cast that they've won the election. So you put in place mechanisms to ensure that your victory is almost certain. This is where our power is around the question of reform. And we would want to see it progressively, Jacob. And I'm not saying it's supposed to be an effect. We would want to see it progressively. But out of 18 issues that SADA and the AU raised, we only have two issues that have been exhaustively dealt with. That doesn't show seriousness on the part of people sitting in parliament. It doesn't show seriousness on the part of the politicians sitting up here. Because they get into power through an election. Now, if you've been quiet since 2018, and, 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 and this is where my problem is. You've been quiet since 2018. And we're 18 months away from an election. And you want to start raising issues. Seriousness on your part. So I hope the parties have not been quiet since 2018. I'll just remind you. I will remind you. The first amendment to the constitution that came in Zimbabwe after the 2018 election was a, an amendment to the electoral act in 2014 it actually started in 2018 and in that amendment there were huge reversals on some of the gains that were gotten ahead of the 2018 elections mm. and the political parties here my question to you as you're sitting in parliament is as the minister of justice then almost refused to even conduct public hearings on that crucial bill what were you doing so we, we, we are at this stage where we are 18 months away from an election. The window of opportunity for reforms is closing. You cannot have reforms in perpetuity and say, we'll continue seeing reforms. Because you'll we'll get reforms in June next year. Those reforms that are going to come late, and we know they will deliberately come late, will have no bearing on the credibility of the election. There will not be enough time for them to materially affect the credibility of the election. So don't fall for that trap where you simply say, well, the reforms will come. There must be a line drawn in the sand to say, at this point, if you bring any more reforms, it's worthless. And this is the kind of language that we would expect from serious politicians who want Zimbabweans to express their will free. So ultimately, my challenge to the politicians in the House is that you've got a huge task ahead. You, the Zimbabwean voters don't owe you their vote. You have to earn it. And I, as a voter, I want to be able to vote for whoever I want, free. And my question to you will be, what have you been doing so that I can express myself free? And, okay, thank you for making it easy for me. But on that point, I would want to remind the panelists of two questions that were asked as you respond. There was the question of intelligence and for ensuring that there is no confusion. We are not talking about intelligence as in a structure, but we are talking about intelligence as in strategic information that uh, informs your decision making as parties. So we want to find out, the question that was asked is, have you invested in intelligence gathering or ensuring that you are also ahead of the competition in terms of intelligence gathering? And then the other one I'm, I'm linking with that question was the one of ideology. I think I'm just linking it with the last point that Tawanda has made. The electorate doesn't owe you the vote. You need to end them. What is your ideology? What are you promising them? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, intelligence, I don't know. We, we have, you see, the person who asked that question was saying, in you, Zanu PF seems to be five steps ahead of you. Now, we've been five steps ahead of Zanu PF. We won the 2008 election. They resorted to violence. Every time we beat them using their brain, they resort to violence. We have got MPs in parliament. We have held the major cities in the country, Arare and Bulawayo, for some time. We won the presidential election and it took them three months to deal with how we had intelligently beat them in that 2008 election. Mm. So as far as using the brain and intelligent, we can beat ZANU-PF with half of our brains. <laughs> the problem we have with ZANU-PF is the resort to violence. 
Make no mistake about what we have been facing. The reason we could not take power in 2008 was that people were being killed like flies on a day-to-day -day basis. Hill Zimbabwe that does tombstones for victims of violence has bought 435 tombstones for political violent victims. I started that organization with the colleagues, Tawanda knows it. 435 tombstones of people who were killed 2008 elections. They simply died. Others disappeared in lakes and dams. So it's not about a, a just thinking while you are sitting there. They take people from the house, they kill them. We discovered him on a hill without his tongue, without his eyes, without his nose. I can go through their names, all of them. Their sleepless nights, some of their children, we are paying school fees for them from our own pockets. From our own pockets. No one gives us the money for those children. So we beat and we beat some PF all the time, but they kill. They don't joke. I campaigned in Harare South. It's not a laughing matter, comrades. You can't laugh. Yeah, true. Otherwise, some of us will walk out of this meeting. <laughs> I'm telling you. Tonderai, Tandare, a lot of people died. Simply just for people to vote. So, we've got ideologies and we have with them beat. The ideology is very simple. We are social democrats. We are social democrats. We believe in an equitable society, education, health, free for all, and so forth and so forth. And all those principles that we have been talking about before. But we are dealing with a party which has a DNA of violence. In Matebele, the, the genocide, 20,000 people died like that. And the switch of violence can be done at any second. So we are not really a people who sit around and say we don't know how to beat ZANU-PF and so forth and so forth. But people have decided that we are going to do the second phase of the democratic struggle of Zimbabwe without violence. We are going to do it peacefully, presenting ourselves to be arrested, presenting ourselves to be dealt with viciously, simply so as to have a moral struggle whereby we don't resort to the methods that harm people to prove our point. Our method is to be peaceful. We will try to catch the young people. I'm actually very surprised because all this time I was belaboring under the impression that I was young. And I was one of the young people. He looks young. Father up here looks young. Who else looks young? Sorry, can I ask you? Because we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, to wind up. So we've got young people that are coming into uh, the struggle, and some of the people who are asking questions are very young. So we hope and will encourage all of you young people to participate in, in some of these processes, and then we could have a, 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 maybe a chance of winning in the near future. Thank you. Uh, for the rest of the panelists, as you respond, just note that it's, t it's 8 o'clock. We were supposed to be closing at 8 o'clock. So can you be very brief as you respond? Thanks. I just want to observe that uh, I got three minutes, but uh, I think you got excited as it went on, others got 10 minutes. Uh, so allow me at least uh, another five minutes. Look, I, I want you to tell, I want to, people to know something about the reality of the world and the world we live in. When you are doing an analysis of your own situation, don't make yourself look too good. That's very important. Once you make yourself look too good, you have wrong strategies for looking good and for doing better. I answered the question of strategy when I made my presentation. I said, we need to go out there and talk to the voters. 
and convince them. So I'm, I'm really answering this question. No, sorry. If you've already answered, then yeah. go on to the next one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the, the things that we fail to understand about ourselves is that ZPF has got this ability to reunite to other elections. They, get, they look divided now. But at every election, I want you to know that they've, they've got this ability to reunite and move as one. And the opposition has got this ability to talk about coalitions and to fragment in the last minute. He talked about the fragmentation that, that, that happened. This is what we must fight against. We must realize that uh, as long as we fragment at the last minute, it appears it's our strategy. We won't be able to win anything. We, that, 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 that's very important. And the second thing is, we have had this history of disputed elections. But is it because they are disputed or we did not do our homework? I want us to do our homework now and not complain. At the, at, at, at the last minute. This is my last word to, to everyone sitting here. We are looking at a Zimbabwe that is very inclusive, that looks at everything and everyone, that looks at programs, not at words. I always say to, to young students that I teach and that I mentor, don't just speak English. Because we are good at that in Zimbabwe. Our words are flowering. Everything that we do is very flower, but it's not practical. When we go towards an election, people are going to be voting. They're not going to be looking, listening to the words that you say. Mutukuti saying and said, when you destroy your neighbor's house, that action does not build your own. We are here trying to denigrate each other, denigrate someone else. And yet we are not putting forward programs. That can convince your voter. We are an educated nation, 95% or more of literacy rate. So we cannot expect our people not to question our programs. We cannot, we cannot expect our people just to listen to us saying things are so bad, let's vote them out. We must provide an alternative program because things are so bad. It's not enough for person in the rural area who has got something on his lap to just say because uh, things are so bad, vote for someone else. Let's give them alternative programs. <coughs> and that's what I'm hoping here, me and our alternative and our possible policy partners, that will sit down and produce real programs, real measurable programs that our people can believe in and then they can vote for us. It is possible to win, it is possible to change this country, and it is possible to move forward. Those are my last words. Thank you. I just wanted to state here that uh, in spite of what the NPF can actually do in terms of violence and all the other shenanigans, uh, I just want to restate that uh, just as in Kamuzu Banda in Marawi, nobody thought he was going to be defeated and did not know that he has actually lost. And I can tell you that come 2018, the same thing is going to happen to our 94-year-old uh, uh, president. That he, he is going to be defeated uh, together with ZPF. And my view is to simply say the, the, the job does not only rest with the politicians. The job rests with all Zimbabweans, especially as we go out there and start this BVR registration. I just want to make sure that uh, I restate this because it's very crucial for us to get that message all. Now I'm going to address two key issues that were raised. The first relates to the class action. The lady asked why I'm propounding IDs for voting. That's not actually correct. I wish you'd attended the class action meeting on Saturday. You would have known that what the class action seeks is for voter registration to start and to start immediately. Z has an obligation to be registering people continuously in terms of Section 17A. So what we don't want is a situation where we're given a window of two weeks to hurry up and register because already they've said, look, you've got 90 days till the kids arrive. Look, that takes us to August. By the time they try and educate people, that's already October. 
quite frankly, the law says that the process has to be continuous. The law also says that we're entitled to an electronic voter's role. We are demanding that in the legal suit. The law also says that the voter's role must be publicly available for inspection. Those are the three key things that the class action seeks. Now, there are some other lingering legal issues that are not dealt with in the class action, but that I'd like the politicians to take note of. BVR, as it stands right now, is illegal. Please read Section 36A of the Electoral Act. Until the President proclaims that you can go ahead and start the creation of a new voter's role, it's patently unlawful. You don't want a situation where you run around, you talk to Laxton, you talk to whoever, only to be told in there that actually we're going back to the Mundele role because everything that was happening was illegal. I'm telling you in advance so that you can act on it and you then don't say, you know, you weren't told. Free legal advice. Another thing, Section 36A of the Electoral Act actually envisages a situation where there are two concurrent voters' roles. In other words, even when the President makes that announcement, you can still have, sitting next to it, Mudele's 2013 voters' role. Please pay attention to that. Mudele's role has not been abolished yet because, as someone said, the, the politicians in Parliament have slept on the job. Please, Section 36A. Run to your lawyers tomorrow and take advice on it. And so, I, you know, I don't take issue with the BBR process and the class action. I, I understand the safeguards that are there, they are important, but please make sure that whatever you do, this constitutional democracy is lawful. Sorry to be the technical legal person who reigns on your parade, but it is what it is. Now, there is another problem legally and uh, in terms of the environment to do with proof of residence. Now, the Constitution states that the process of registration, the exercising of your right to vote under Section 67, must be a simple process. The minute you tell an 18-year-old who's living with their relative or even their parents that, look, you, you need a utility bill, they can't provide that. That you need to get an affidavit, they're going to be like, where do I get a commissioner of votes? In the end, they'll just sit at home and say, look, it's just too hard, I can't do it. And why should, for an adult, their, the exercise and realization of their right to vote depend on whether or not their dad says, yes, I'll sign an affidavit for you? That's not good enough. That's not what Section 67 guarantees. More importantly, you've got homeless people, you've got people who are tenants, you've got people who are residing in settlements where there are no addresses, where it's not as simple to produce proof of residence. Now, people do complain about constituency stuffing. Now, that's a myth in the sense that Constituency stuffing took place in 2013 where the proof of residence requirement was there. You'll see Mount Pleasant, there were a heap of soldiers that came in and just, I mean, tonight it has got all the, the, the evidence there. They started voting. You know why? If you say proof of residence, the people who win are Zanu Pier. It takes nothing for the head of the barracks at KG6 to produce proof of residence for 7,000 soldiers. It's nothing. It's just they're good at administrative bureaucracy. They will invest time in that. But you, as the opposition, by the time you try and persuade 7,000 students to get a proof of residence from their parents or to get an affidavit from a lawyer, you are losing. It's in your interest to look for the simplest, most uh, you know, efficient process for a young person especially to, to register to vote. Now, what safeguards exist? The key safeguard is this. One person, one vote. So when you go and register, and by the way, registration is a constitutional requirement, I think under Section 157. When you go and register to vote, if you declare Mount Pleasant, the scare safeguard is that you will have to then go and vote in Mount Pleasant. So nothing can be gained by creating these further administrative hurdles that will just make it difficult for the young people you want to capitalize on to vote. So please, proof of residence is not your friend at all. Now, coming to something else, someone said, look, but what's the efficacy of uh, social media? What proof do you have? And, you know, what about the rural-urban divide? Now, the key thing with the rural-urban divide is this. It's bad. stupid, number one. Everything there is a, a political issue. But when you go there and you say, look, they get to look at you and say, Mount Pleasant, Zanu Pier. Harare South, Zanu Pier. Harare East, Zanu Pier. What we actually need in Harare here is people to educate us about how to vote. We need to first vote against the system.
system and consolidate in the areas where we're strong. Because ZANU-PF is forcing you into the rural areas where they know you cannot penetrate. And making you keep the, the, the trouble with our opposition politicians, I say this with respect, is they can't multitask. When they talk about electoral reform, they then forget about the issues. And all we hear every day is BBR, 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 BBR. They forget that bond notes have come. They forget that people are losing jobs. They, they cannot multitask. So yes, try and penetrate the rural areas, but don't forget the Harare vote. You're not running Harare right now. Harare is a ZANU-PF stronghold. I'm sure everyone saw on Twitter today, the Twitter that you so despise, that form that ZANU-PF is uh, giving out for the housing stands. When you sign a pact with Zanpia that you'll bring four members and you'll abide by the rules in exchange for a housing stand. They're not doing that in Uzumba. They're doing that here, Kuwazan. They're doing it here in Highfield. They're doing it in Harare North and Hatcliff. So what's the efficacy of uh, social media? The information goes around. And if anything, we should be happy. Because social media means that we can document any violence as it happens and it gets around quickly. It goes viral. We've seen it with the police roadblocks. The minute there's a violation, we quickly see. So with that, you know that ZBC is not going to publish the violations that the police carry out. But social media is there, so I don't understand people who despise it. And to the extent that uh, that Afrobarometer barometer report despises social media, it's erroneous. It's not borne out by the evidence. And, you know, there's something that people haven't spoken about right now. And I think zanu is a little bit better than the opposition in terms of learning quickly. We need to evaluate what took place in 2016 and as far as the citizens' movement is concerned. We have to evaluate why it was successful, where it succeeded, and where it failed. And whatever succeeded in as far as the citizens' movement is concerned, let's do more of that. Whatever failed, let's take it away. But let's not fight sideways and say that, look, none of it worked, because there are some aspects that definitely worked. So let's capitalize on those. I hope that answers the questions I was asked. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I will say that, uh, first of all, ZANU-PF speaks to the electorate. ZANU-PF speaks to the electorate. When I won in Urungwe West, 65% of the people who voted for me were women. And that says a lot. Women are disciplined. They don't go either way, they're not excited, and they're vulnerable. When Zanu PF moves in, it is dealing with a voter. It is not second guess. And that is done through the strategy of the village heads which in the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission report of Uruguay West, which have circulated to all the political parties. They have done nothing because the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission is the only constitutionally mandated body to investigate on human rights violations. All the political parties have it, but they have not taken that document to court to challenge because it's different from an NGO because the court will ask what what is your local stand in this, your NGO? But the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission is mandated according to Constitution uh, Section 242. So when they give a report and say there was violence, the village heads were involved, you then take it. But like uh, uh, Advocate uh, Mayer says, we seem to be having this information, the brilliance of lawyers we have, we don't see them acting. If you want them to represent you, you must give them money. But they're equally crying about democracy. For to me, what we have right now is what we expect. The other thing that I must say to you is, amazingly here there's a coalition. And I was saying to myself, so who's the spokesperson? You see? So who's the spokesperson for the coalition? Because I was expecting all questions leading to the coalition, one person speaks to represent the coalition. Already there's confusion before we go anywhere. You just hear it. There was no one saying, I will take responsibility for that. So to me, there is the aspect of intelligence. I will get up to say this. Never underestimate the role of the military. I will repeat. Never underestimate the role of the military. 
have 20 million people voting for you. If the military is not comfortable with you leading, they will not give in. They are the last line of defense. BT always says to me, you know me, so the name title did the state house. They could be the two states for it. I did not copy it. They could be military, I guess they could be. Don't blame the president. The president had conceded to that. We all know that. But the military said no. How can we allow people who want to put us in prison to rule? Some of the statements which are made by political parties are reckless. What have the political parties done to address that, to give comfort? National events they don't attend. National Heroes Acre, the military is there watching and you're not there. They're saying if we die, will these guys bury us here? No, they're not. Don't underestimate them. Already they've gained you and they will never until. So don't talk about the intelligence in Yugoslavia. Talk about engaging the intelligence here. Whether there are 15 CIOs here, they are human. They are going through the same problems. So don't scare us by CIO. Everybody in this country is a CIO. No one will allow something to happen to the president which is not proper. Zimbabweans are peaceful people. So if you tell me right now you want to do a coup to the president, I'm already a CIO. I will report to you because I don't believe in the coup. So why do we believe that CIO is us giving information? It does not work without information. So this whole myth of CIO does not work. Already you are planting that fear in people before we go anywhere else. So we have got so many doubting Thomases. Zanupia, whether it's a 120 year old, they have a candidate 2018. The fascists in Zanupia are after Mugabe. They are not Mugabe 2's 2018. They have decided, they have concluded, they are moving with all these youthful rallies that they are having. They go back. Well, you say they're using buses, they're in power. When Obama is campaigning for a Democrat against a Republican, you have never heard an American say, Action Sir Air Force One, state resources. It is part of power. It is part of the package where you power. So don't complain. I can't put on the Republicans that you complain with them. So to me, it is pretty critical that we understand exactly who we are. The rural vote. Whether you like it or not, it's 72% of, of the thing. Who has gone there? What have we done to go? Um, you want one minute now. What have we done as political parties? Holding a rally at a growth point. A growth point is for everyone. I want to see what your party members will do when Chandra is at the, a rally in a growth point. What are the foot soldiers doing to mobilize people? For as long as you don't go to the ground, and talk to the people about what it takes, and I will finish by this quote. Nelson Mandela and Tabo Becky were keen to see change in South Africa. A party was there, it was very clear. They then decided to take it to the streets, and it failed dismally. A white man was part of it. A white man says, How much work did you do in telling people about the party? How much did you do in telling them that there's a party and this is what we want to do? They said they did not do anything. They said, first thing, the ideology that you have, the people must have a buy-in. And when the people now had a buy-in about a party, what it was, then there were those protests which were endless and that's where South Africa is. For as long as you sit an idea, opposition parties speak to the same people every day. If you see red in Gweru, these are people who are converted to hate. If you see blue, green in the urban, it is the same people. I am looking for a different constituency at what level where we see 300 people there. My, my final rally uh, in Norton was in what 15 which was rural. Zanu PF on the day where David stands in what 15, the road was blocked. I couldn't even go through. But I said to my guys, I must I had to do something. I had to use a different car altogether. There were thousands and thousands of people in the very same way. I asked my team on the ground, do we have people? They said, yes, the people are coming. I had 4,000 people who had walked 
And that was the last rally I had, and I knew victory is certain, because the rural people had responded. In the house of the Mazali PF, until you get them there, and use the people, they're not different people. Then you can talk about victory 2018. The way things are right now, Zanu PF has the state on its side. So state apparatus will come in when it is appropriate. It takes its time, but it will come in when it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were in the same school, so I guess the politician's effect was on me. But uh, thank you very much for coming. We would usually have one round of one minute, but lessons learned, we were told to learn lessons. Lessons learned is that it will not be one minute. And I think really they've said all that they can say to us. And the good thing about these public dialogues is we can always continue outside of this formality. So just in terms of... Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, just to respond to the question of reforms, our position as the NCA, we believe that we squandered the opportunity that we were given to write a new constitution. We will take 30 more, 37 more years to write the constitution by picking one section of the constitution each time we, we decide to work on constitution on, on, on reforms. So it is actually an opportunity for us to realize the plan that we made. The question of rural inroads, we, we as the NCA, we are participating in by-elections countrywide. Wherever the by-elections are, are announced, we are participating. So we are actually uh, doing membership drive. And the question of ideology, our ideology is uh, social democratic. We are there for the poor, for the underprivileged, for the, the minorities. Each and everyone uh, who is a citizen of Zimbabwe, we, we are, you are remembered in our manifesto. And the last one, Youth, about the youth, the question of youth. As the NCA, we welcome all the youth of Zimbabwe. If you look at our, our president as well, he's pretty young, 51, and all youths are welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So our topic was of elections in Zimbabwe, BVR, coalitions and factions. What is the Zimbabwe we want beyond 2018? The objective being for different perspectives to come into the public domain. We hear from the different players in our political uh, political field. And then as Zimbabweans, you make, up, you, you make up your mind what you want to follow up on, what you want to do. I just want to thank on behalf of Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, uh, the panelists who have come here. Um, I'm really not going to go back with the names, but just feel that we have appreciated that you came here. You took time off, it's a cold June night, but uh, some of the Zimbabweans. And more importantly, also want to thank you people that came in the public, in your numbers, for being part of the, of the dialogue, and also even for asking pertinent questions. We got a lot of more information from the questions that you asked. That also helps us in terms of that same intelligence that was being talked about. Lastly, I'm also going to thank my colleague, Glanis Changachirele. It was not an easy talk. And uh, the two of us come from a field where we are known as women's rights activists. It was also a good space to be in here. It was not easy, but we think that we were able to work on it, and it was useful for all of us. So we just want to thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Peace.